Hey everybody, I'm Mike Sattel, the founder of Sattel Tutoring, and this is episode six of my 10-part series on the strategies for the digital SAT. In this episode, I'm gonna talk about strong words, which if you are subscribed to my channel and you've seen any of my videos, even from the old SAT, you know that strong words is an important part of the reading strategy. So we're gonna cover that, but it's a difficult concept. So I strongly recommend that you go back and watch episode one of this series on dumb summaries, which was the main idea for the entire reading section. It's gonna put this in perspective. And even though I don't use the phrase strong words in that episode, I definitely use the concept to help me understand the, con the connotations of the passages and the choices. So anything that I highlighted that was a positive or a negative word, those were strong words that were helping me understand the main idea and I used them to understand my dumb summary. But in this episode, we're gonna dive deeper because strong words are about more than just connotation and we need to compare them to weak words. So what makes a word strong or weak? Well, it's not something that you can just memorize. There isn't a list of strong words that I can just give you. This comes from practice, this comes from experience, this is something that will take you time, but if you make a conscious effort to adapt this into your way of thinking for the reading section, it will make a difference on your score, regardless of where you're scoring now. If you have a bad score, it's probably because in reading you're not noticing the strong words in the passage, so you're missing the main ideas, the things that are most important about all of these topics. But even if you're scoring a 700 right now, strong words are probably why you're missing those last few questions. You're probably not noticing the strong words in the answer choices that, that make you fall for a trap. So I'm gonna show you in both cases how to start filtering out the strong words from the weak words so you know what really matters for any sort of passage. And it's difficult to define. So I'm hoping that by giving you a couple of examples, we can kind of come to an understanding of what it means. So in these five cases, try to just use your intuition to determine whether the word underlined is strong or weak, right? It's, we're all, it's all about a cat, but what feels like a strong piece of information about the cat? Three of these are, are strong in my opinion, two of them would be weak. Starting with number one, a bad cat, definitely strong. If we had uh, just a picture of a cat and then we were told it was bad, now we have this negative image of the cat. So that's definitely changing my opinion about the cat in a meaningful way. So connotation definitely is gonna continue to be an important part of the strong words strategy. But if you told me that it was a house cat, that really doesn't have a connotation and it doesn't really change my opinion in any way. If you just told me to think of a cat, I would probably picture a house cat. Most people are not gonna think of a tiger if you just tell them to think of a cat. So telling me it's a house cat doesn't really move my opinion, my image in any sort of meaningful way. House here is a weak word. In, and the SAT loves to do this where they just give you tons of description that somehow matters for understanding like the image, but not in a meaningful way that moves the story along. So house cat here, definitely weak. Red cat, also weak. And you might be thinking, but there aren't red cats. That's weird, right? Red, there's orange cats, but red cats, that's very strange. Why wouldn't that be important information? Well, mostly because it's still description. And it might be. If the rest of the passage was making a really big deal about how weird it was that this cat was red, I would rethink my opinion, and maybe red cat would be a strong word. But by itself, a color is not really giving me any sort of meaningful uh, understanding of this cat. It might be changing my mental image, but it's not really moving the story along. Whereas if we said it was a pretty cat, now my opinion of the cat has changed in a meaningful way. It's definitely a positive connotation, so it kind of works like a bad cat, right? It changes my, my opinion of whether I like this cat or not. But actually, pretty cat is even stronger than bad cat. Bad cat, there's lots of ways for a cat to be bad. It could be uh, have a bad attitude, a bad smell. It could be ugly, right? It's lots of ways for it to be bad. But if you tell me it's a pretty cat, it's a good cat, but it's good in this very specific way of how it looks. So that's a stronger word because it's, it's bringing more meaning to this idea of the cat, this image that I have. But connotation isn't everything. If you told me it was an expensive cat, that's still a strong word, but the connotation, I don't know, expensive is a tricky word. It could go either way, but I still know something meaningful now about that cat that I didn't before. 
And we could substitute in other similar words and kind of experiment a little bit with the connotation, right? If you told me it was an overpriced cat, then I would say, yeah, you paid too much. It's not worth whatever it cost. If you told me it was a valuable cat, then I'd say, oh yeah, good deal, right? Like maybe that's the cat that Garfield was based on. It was worth the money. Expensive, you know, Sometimes I think that things are expensive because I don't want to pay the price or sometimes expensive is good. I think if something's expensive, it has a higher quality to it than something that's inexpensive. So expensive doesn't necessarily have a set connotation, but no matter what the word is here, I know it has to do with money. So here's a case where a word is strong, not necessarily because of positives and negatives, but because it brings something else to the table. And that's kind of how we need to think of strong words. Your opinion of this cat is like a, a big boulder, a big object. And weak words are trying to push that and they're not really moving it in any particular direction. But strong words, they have the power to, to change your opinion, to change your image of that cat in some way. It's hard to define, but we need to start thinking of strong words as going beyond connotation. And, and here's an example I think that'll help us here. We're gonna go slow through it, but you'll notice that we're not really talking positives and negatives as we do it. We're still thinking of words that impact our understanding, but they're not really about connotations. This is going beyond what we talked about in episode one. Let's take a look at the first sentence here. In 1977, quantum physicist Lorraine Garganola theorized that a subatomic particle with negative electromagnetic spin might be responsible for bridging the gap between matter and energy. Lots of house cat stuff here. Yes, it's all great. I learned about a particle, but I don't care about that. The one word that stands out to me, theorized. Right? I don't care about the description of the cat. What, what is the cat doing here? Right? So in this case, I don't even know whether the cat is Garganola. Maybe this is a story about this, this woman. Maybe it's a story about the particle. I don't know. But the fact that it's theorized tells me something important. It's, it's a science idea that hasn't been proven yet. And also knowing from experience the SAT, like this is a common theme of these passages. You have some scientific idea and we're going to do an experiment. We're going to disprove it, prove it, whatever it may be. So this is also just something that comes from experience too of knowing what kinds of stuff show up in the SAT. But even beyond that, the word might also stands out to me here because it's repeating this idea of uncertainty. We don't really know if this particle is there. And look at the bullet point right above there. Main ideas are repeated ideas. This is really important when we're trying to come up with our dumb summary. What comes up again and again, that's probably important. In sentence two, uh, for the next 40 years, what became known as the Garganola particle was mostly convenient speculation, more on the theory stuff. That is until Juniper Wong and colleagues claimed that they had observed the particle in 2019. So we definitely have a strong word that's showing this contrast. The word until is, is, is moving the opinion of this particle in a different direction because now it's not just a theory, it has been observed. So we're, we're starting to get the story here. Sentence three. Wong and her team fired helium atoms at a rod of plutonium-242, measuring the heat generated from the nuclear collisions and using electromagnets to divert other particles created during the reaction. This is all house cat stuff. This is just describing the experiment. I know it's not gonna matter. It's just that they did the experiment that matters. I don't really care about the specifics. That might also be partly just, again, knowing how these science passages work. The details are not really that important. Unaffected by the electromagnets, the Garganola particles pass into a vacuum tube, producing a faint green glow that provided the first ever validation of Garganola's hypothesis. So validation, that matches nicely with the observation that we've now proven this thing. And hypothesis calls back to the idea that it was a theory at first. It wasn't proven. So this whole story is about a theory being proven. That's my dumb summary. Notice, my summary does not include what the theory was, what the details of the particle were. It does not include the experiment that did the proving. I don't care. That's not what this is gonna be about. My strong words are not gonna be these little details about the science. It's gonna be what we learned about the science that matters. So let's see if we can sort through the choices in a way that's very similar, looking for strong words. Choice A here. Plutonium-242 is a necessary component of experiments involving the Garganola particle. Well, you might eliminate that saying like, well, plutonium is part of the story, but it's not the story, right? I, I don't want to pick a choice that emphasizes that. And, and you're right, but let's, let's really look for a strong word because it's much more to me that they say it's a necessary component. Right? If they just said it's a component, then, then maybe this choice is a, a better choice. But right now, to say that it's necessary, that's really, really strong. This, this, we couldn't know anything about this particle without plutonium-242. 
Maybe that's true, I'm not a scientist. But if it is true, it's gotta say it in the lines. And it just really doesn't here. When they bring up plutonium, it's just kind of like an extraneous detail about the story, about the experiment. It's not saying that it's necessary. So choice A, definitely wrong. And in the next episode, I'm gonna talk about trap answer choices, which often involve strong words that we don't, at first glance, think of as strong. The idea of necessity, of requirement, this is a very common trap answer on the SAT, so we'll talk more about stuff like choice A in the next episode. For now, let's look at B. Scientists have discovered a new method for isolating subatomic particles. Maybe that's true. If it is, then they need to specifically say that this was a new method. They definitely describe the method of firing the helium at the plutonium, but did they say that it's new? No. There's no word that copies that idea. Now, if they said Wong and her team fired, or Wong and her team used an innovative strategy by firing helium atoms at a broad of plutonium, well, innovative does mean new, so then we'd have evidence. But as it stands now, that word new is a very strong word, and we are not allowed to just assume that it's new. The passage in some way needs to say it, and it does not. So let's look at C. Scientists have demonstrated the ex existence of the Garganola particle using empirical evidence. Well, we've got some tough words there, empirical we might not know, but we definitely can understand the middle part, the existence of the Garganola particle. Well, that matches nicely with our dumb summary, right? It was a theory, and now they've proven that it exists. So that seems pretty good, but a lot of people are going to be turned off by this choice because it's very weak. It leaves out detail, and, and they think that that's bad, right? Scientists have demonstrated the existence of the Garganola particle. Well, they did demonstrate it, they, they did an experiment, but does it talk about how they demonstrated it? No, it's using empirical evidence, so do they talk about what the evidence is in the choice? No, right, they leave it out. The choice is very vague. The passage talks about those things, it says how they demonstrated it, it says what the evidence was, but the choice is leaving that out. That's okay. Weak answers are not necessarily bad, mostly because they're easy to prove. We can find stuff in the passage that does it, even if it's leaving out some of the details. But let's compare that to D just for this, uh, to see really why weak versus strong is such a big deal. Uh, the Garganola particle's negative electromagnetic spin made it difficult to separate the particle from an atom. Well, it's, it took them 40 years. Maybe, maybe it was difficult, right? But do they actually say that it was difficult? Or are we saying that it was difficult? Are we assuming that if it took 40 years, it was difficult? Maybe that's just us. And, and they don't specifically say either that it's the spin that made it difficult. This is a very strong claim. And so we need to focus on these words. That one word in D is all it takes for us to get rid of this and pick choice C. And this is how it's gonna go. Sometimes we uh, can prove the right answer right pretty definitively. Other times we're proving the wrong answers wrong pretty definitively. Regardless, we're using strong and weak words to think about the choices and we're looking for proof in the passage. So if we have the strong words in the passage originally, we probably understood what we read, and then we use strong words in the choices to find things to go hunting for in the passage that we really, really need to prove. So it takes time. It's a, it's a process that you're gonna need to slow down at first for, but if you do, you will do better. And one thing you can't let slow you down is when you don't know certain words, right? You can't say, oh, I don't know that word, so I'm gonna cross this choice out. Empirical is a tough word. It means experimental or real. It it's kind of fits nicely with the rest of this passage. We have this um, theory that's kind of maybe proven through math or something abstract, and then they're using real evidence. They can see the glow, which is real, it's touchable, it, it's, it's based on fact. So. That word is good to know for the SAT, but it wouldn't affect whether or not I would pick C here. It just It's a word I ignore because I don't know if it's strong or weak. Hopefully there's other words in the choice that I can use instead. Let's do one more example here. And again, we're gonna kind of go slow, but we're still kind of doing the same thing. It says logically completes the text, but basically we're gonna look for our main idea again. With participants from over 70 cities worldwide, the Global Neighborhood Ambassador Program connects students with host families in other countries for a semester abroad, during which the students get firsthand experience with the unique ways that civic institutions mitigate problems associated with urban life. This is all house cat stuff. Again, it's telling me about the program. I kind of need to know that to know what we're talking about, but it's not in informing my real opinion here. I don't know if the program is good or bad, or it's just, it's empty of any real knowledge here. So for now, I would not highlight anything. Maybe if something comes up later, I'll come back. But then we go to the next sentence. The program is not without its flaws, however. Well, clearly now we're talking about negative. So this is gonna help with dumb summaries. Negative stuff is definitely gonna matter in my answer choices. But let's keep reading for now. 
Despite being open to all, the program's application process considers whether pairing the student with a host family for an extended period would create a financial burden for the host. Again, lots of house cat stuff. They're repeating what the program does, but they do end with the strong phrase, financial burden. So again, it's negative, that's helpful, but it's also adding this idea of money, finances, into the mix. That's probably gonna matter when we sort through the choices, and we're about to do that because the end just kind of reiterates that it's negative. Some critics worry that in practice, the program, blah, blah, blah. So let's look at the choices. And oh, so and our dumb summary, let me not forget that. It's we definitely need something negative, but on top of that, we need something with finances, with money. That was the strong idea that didn't have a connotation necessarily that we need to make sure appears in our choices. And when we look at the choices, we're going to be able to find the negative stuff pretty easily. So that, in this case, is not really helpful. A lot of times with dumb summaries, positive negative does eliminate some answers. Here, we're going to need more. So let's think about the money stuff as we sort through the other pieces. Choice A, the program might send students to cities with poor public transit, making it difficult for them to witness a wide variety of local problems and solutions. Well, public transit stands out to me. That's strong because that's a very specific idea. Now, did they talk about that idea in the passage? No, I don't think so. I could invent some story about like, if you have a financial burden, then you don't have the money for a car and so you take the bus and the train. And if the bus and the train are not good, then you can't go anywhere. But that's me telling a story. The story needs to tell the story, and it doesn't talk about public transit here, so this is not going to be a good answer. Choice B, the program could end up excluding low-income students who already lack the resources to travel and experience other ways of life. So we definitely have the money piece here. There's not really anything else that jumps out to me, so the strong words seem to all be provable. I don't know, maybe that's enough, but I should look at C and D and compare and, and see before I pick this. So choice C, the program discriminates against students from rural areas who might benefit from exposure to urban environments. No, there's nothing about rural areas here. It's all about cities. So just that's a strong word, no proof. Choice D, uh, the program will not be able to secure long-term sources of funding that would allow it to expand to more cities. Well, funding definitely hits that finance piece, but notice this choice is stronger than B. It hits the funding idea, hits the money idea, but then it goes further, expanding the program to more cities. Did they talk about that in the passage? I don't think so. Whereas the only other thing in B is maybe that like their people are traveling and experiencing other ways of life. And that is kind of what they talk about in that first sentence where they describe the program. It's meant to get you, get, you, know, get you this experience with other places. So B is the answer. And again, it's kind of right because it's weak, whereas the other choices have these really strong words that we can't prove. But to be clear, choice B still has some strong words, excluding, low income, lack, the resources. These are strong ideas, but they're provable with other strong words in the passage. So that's our goal. We want to match strong words from the choices with strong words from the passage. If you can't do that, the choice is probably wrong. And so we're kind of always moving back and forth between the two, but we want to filter the strong words from the weak ones. And this will take practice. A lot of times the easiest strong words have something to do with connotation, but it goes beyond that. So again, try to think of it like, What's the cat in the story? What's the thing it's about? And then what words push your opinion of the cat? Move your idea in some actual tangible direction. Those are the words that matter most. But weak words aren't all bad. We want to kind of skip over them as we read the, the passage. But when we start to see weak choices, then that's probably a good thing. A lot of right answers on the SAT are right because they're not strong, because there's nothing really to check, and they easily check off whatever we need from the passage. So weak answers are not necessarily bad. So if something's vague, it, you might have to pick it. So just be prepared for that. And like I said, I am going to talk more about strong words in the next episode when I go over the trap answer choices. A lot of times traps on the SAT exist because we have these strong words that we might not think of as strong. So for us, they don't really stand out, but they might make a big difference. And so there are patterns in this. So I will talk about that. That can help you sort through the choices in, in another way. So please make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss that episode when I release it. Um, and as always, when it comes to your scores, don't settle for less, settle for more. Thanks for watching.